we shall now go on to our next speaker dr praful kumar who is going to tell us how to the different techniques to manage corneal perforations on to you doctor Dr. Praful is the senior consultant from RP Center and um, would tell us which is better, the adhesive tissue, the T non patch, or the conjunctival flap. Okay, if my slides are visible. Yes, yes slides are visible, you're audible. Yeah. So yes. the topic is a little bit lengthy, uh, like uh, comparing whether to use uh, cyanoacrylate glue or T nuns or conjunctival flap. So tenon patch graft, it, it has been discussed, described for corneal perforation, small as well as large, scleral melting as well as neurotrophic ulcer. My experience is largely with corneal perforation and corneal fistula. So corneal fistula, uh, I hope you all know that as you can see on the left, although it appears apparently healed, but when you stain it, you will see there are some uh, leak. Okay, so these are the cases in initially when I did tenon patch graft. And this is a microscope into the OCD picture. You can see there is a track which is all the epithelial lies, but still there is a communication to enter a chamber. So this is a video. Normally we do such cases in emergency. So sorry about the quality of video, but you can see there is a leak and the perforation is almost two by two mm size. So you, first you have to measure the size of the defect and then measure and take either supratemporal or supranasal quadrant and do a peritomy and try to separate the tenons tissue both from the conjunctiva as well as the underlying epistleral tissue. So uh, it's not a very difficult procedure. Easily you can uh, do that. If you have done ECC or any uh, congenital surgery, then it won't be that difficult for you. So idea is to take a little bit oversized graft as compared to the size of the defect. And those who have done tenons, they must uh, corroborate with this. Tenons tissue, it has basically two parts. One is a little bit more fibrotic surface. And then there is a more like fibro fatty tissue. So you have to trim that fibro fatty tissue. And uh, you have to orient your graft in such a manner that the uh, fibrotic component is uh, anterior. And uh, one easy way to identify that, you can stain the tenon capsule. It, usually the anterior fibrotic part takes the stain, but not the fatty tissue. And you can create 360 degree lamellar pocket all around the defect so that the graft stuck in, tuck in well. And suturing, uh, you can uh, do any sort of suturing. People, I have seen a lot of modification of this technique. So I prefer interrupted suture because that allows me to adjust any complication postoperatively. And uh, the, you must bury all the suture. If you couldn't bury and it's an uh, acutely inflamed eye, you can simply put a BCL over that also. So this is just a uh, picture of uh, such cases. You can see there was a free communication. And this is a picture showing tenon patch uh, well uh, covering that fistulous track. So we published uh, a series of six cases in BGO, subsequently, Dr. Namda came out with this paper, including 31 cases of tenon patch graft. The outcome is usually good, but you can see the, the few problems with tenon patch is uh, somehow there are few vessels, superficial vessels, they come up and uh, uh, could be due to some intense inflammation postoperatively. And sutures, you have to uh, remove the sutures postoperatively, which is uh, maybe difficult in, uh, in such cases. And as you can see, vascularization is there. And uh, however, but uh, you, you can see this was a little bit uh, large neurotrophic ulcer. Well, uh, it healed and quite nicely. Got epithelial line. You can see the tenon tissue here. This is a uh, picture sent to me by one of my fellow, where uh, she was she had no access to patch graft or corneal tissue, so she did a tenon patch in such a big ulcer, and it healed quite well. So limitations, as I've said, it's an opaque tissue. So if you are doing it. In a central corneal perforation, the patient is not going to be rehabilitated visually. You have to do a secondary graft. It doesn't have any tectonic support, as you would have noticed during that video. Cyanoacrylate glue gives you some tectonic support, but tenon's patch is not going to give you that. If you are doing it in a large perforation, you have to supplement it with the glue. Leak, I'll just show you a video about that. Yes, sutures are a big problem because it's an acutely inflamed eye. You have to do a second procedure to remove all the sutures. And yes, it induces vascularization, not the as severe as cyanoclid glue. But yes, it do induce some vascularization. This is a patient where next day there was a leak. You can see 
uh, it retracted the graph was uh, the graph didn't have any tectonic uh, strength and it was a little bit bigger size perforation and it was leaking from all around so in all these cases stenus has to be supplemented with some uh, cyanoacrylate glue so advantage is yes it offers you an alternative especially when you don't have an eye bank setup when you don't have amg or donor cornea with you cost effective Although cyanoclad uh, glue cost you hardly 1000 or rupees, but there will be still some patient that they can't afford even that much money. And at times you are sitting in casualty in midnight, somebody comes with perforation and you don't have access to glue. Then at that time, also tenants uh, patch can help you. Glue with BCL. Yes, there are two variants, biological, the fibrin glue that we commonly use and the, the other one is cyanoclad glue. And uh, I think most of us would agree that for corneal perforation, usually we prefer cyanoclad blue only. Why? Because it's a very fast procedure, the cost is less, and the most important is give you tectonic support. So you can do it in office as an office procedure in the slit lamp, or you can take the patient to microscope and do it under uh, sterile precautions. And this is a short video about that. This is the cyanoclad blue, histacryl blue that we that at our center we have this. So my this is this was a case of desmatocil as you can see. So important trick is you have to divide the epithelium surrounding the area of your uh, perforation or the desmatocil. And uh, people prefer to use uh, some needle and put it through a uh, thirty gauge or twenty three gauge needle. But my preferred procedure is this: take any blunt instrument, just uh, touch the glue and just touch it to the surface of your interest. This allows you to apply a very thin layer of glue because one of the problem with glue is it forms a, uh, if you apply it too much, then it will uh, cause a lot of surface irritation and there could be GPC and even it is difficult to place the BCL also. So allow it for some time and after that you can do a thorough wash. But this was a simple case. In At times when you are dealing with perforation cases, you have to do a uh, interchamber chamber paracentesis and you have to inject air or rarely maybe viscoelastic uh, to form the entire chamber. But uh, most of the time, the result with cyanoclad glue is quite satisfying when the perforation size is uh, less than 2 mm. There have been other techniques, people have described uh, other techniques, like this was the needle-based technique. But one clue is when you are using this, uh, little retract the plunger a little bit once a blob is formed. But this will allow you to apply very little amount of glue onto the surface. The other commonly used technique is patch technique. In this technique, you can take a dermatological or skin trephine of 2 mm size and take multiple uh, sections of your uh, sterile drape. And uh, using any blunt instrument, you can apply some ointment over that and pick these small patches. This patch technique is usually useful when the uh, ulcer sizes or perforation size is a little bit uh, larger. And this ointment allows you to pick these small patches. Pick any one of them and just, just apply some cyanoclid glue to the surface. And this, this will allow you to just patch it over the area of defect. So this allows you to apply a controlled amount of glue with the patch. The problem, uh, sorry, the ad other advantages of cyanoclid glue compared to your tenens is it has some effect on preventing stromal melting. And also some bacteriostatic effect uh, for organisms like staph is E. coli and uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So these are a few examples of uh, post-op pictures of glue uh, BCL. This was a post-op post CXL keratitis patient, which healed well, but you, you must notice this vascularization that is there. This is the surface magnified picture of a surface of a glue. See the glue, no matter how much you the thin layer you apply, the surface is always irregular. And by chance, if your BCL dislocates, then it's very likely that the patient will develop some papillary conjunctivitis. This is a patient which healed, but you see the amount of vascularization that the glue has induced. Because at times, there may be some active infection and you may not be able to give steroid post-operatively. Patch graft, yes, if the size of perforation is large, you have to do a patch graft. And in that case, all the complications of cornea transplant will be there. Congenital flap, I am not a fan of this technique. This is the picture from Sun et al. recently published paper where they use this partial selective pedunculatal flap where the conjunctival uh, graft is mobilized and advanced to the site of perforation after putting in a layer of AMG. Conjunctival flap, uh, then you may find few big fans of this technique, but usually this technique uh, has some severe problems like it completely obscures the view. You cannot see what is going on behind the conjunctival flap. 
and it's an all or none operation because since you have advanced the conjunctiva, you don't have a second chance to uh, correct it if anything goes wrong. Lastly, as since most of this patient requires some secondary corneal transplant for uh, visual rehabilitation, conjunctival graft they induce a lot of vascularization. So it's not a good idea if you're planning to rehabilitate the patient using your optical PKP later on. So this is the review article that I published along with my team, surgical alternatives to keratoplasty in microbial keratitis. Here we had discussed all the available techniques, not only these three, but the other techniques like tarsorapy or uh, fibrin glue, corneal patch graft. I have taken uh, the section of the table that uh, suggests this, does compare this three technique. You, as you can see, the healing rate is almost same and even congenital flap, the healing rate of 80 to 95 percent has been reported. But the main, main problem with tissue adhesive is they induce uh, corneal vascularization and the foreign body reaction associated with that. With tendon patch, although it's a good technique, but the tensile strength is almost nil. So you have to supplement with some cyanocleid glue. Conjectival flap, it's good. If the patient doesn't have any visual potential, you can go ahead with this. But the problem is even in those cases, cosmesis will be a big issue. So when and where to use this technique, it depends on availability. If it is, if all the three are available and the size of perforation is uh, less than 2 mm, I would prefer to go for TABCL, uh, tissue adhesive. Why it is very simple and quite effective. If it's not available, I would prefer to go for tenon's patch rather than a congenital flap. Tectonic strength, if a person is a little bit la on larger side, uh, you cannot do tenon's patch or congenital flap. You have to supplement them with glue only. Cost-wise, yes, tenon's and congenital, these are autologous tissues, so they don't uh, increase cost in any way. But TABCL, yes, it do cost some uh, amount of uh, money for the patient. Future graft, if you're planning to rehabilitate the patient using a keratoplasty subsequently, it's always too good to go for a autologous tissue like tenon's patch or multilayered AMG, which was not a part of my uh, topic. So this is it. If the corneal perforation is small, go for a TABCL. But if you don't have that access to that, go for any of the procedure. If it is a little bit large, tenon's is preferred, but you may have to supplement with, with some uh, tectonic uh, support like cyanoclid glue. But the most important point is whenever you are dealing with such cases, because all these cases present to you in uh, maybe in emergency uh, OR, you have to close it. Use a BCL, use a AMG, whatever is available with you, you can use that, but please close the link. Thank you very much for the kind attention and thank you Chitra ma'am for allowing me to speak on this platform. Thank you, Dr. Praful. That was a very thorough detailed talk. I would take two simple questions with Dr. Nikhil before Himanshu takes on again. Uh, <clears throat> keeping aside the cost part of it, Dr. Nikhil, you are there? Dr. Yeah, he's there. Yeah, he's there. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. yeah if uh, cost is yeah. not an issue, uh, yeah. for very small perforations, would you anybody think of using a fibrin glue or it's only a cyanoacrylate? And in case of uh, active inflammations uh, like peripheral uh, PUK, uh, yeah. How would you deal with those perforations? Would you temporarily use tenons or would you use active in immunosuppression and use a tissue graft? Yeah, so if you have a PUK, of course, we need to, uh, you know, use systemic treatment to quieten the eye before we do any patch graft or corneal graft. But before we do that, uh, for a temporary measure, one could do a conjunctival resection, glue BCL sort of procedure. And it can help us to buy time. But sometimes, you know, the patient lands to us with a big perforation with iris prolapse with a PUK. And at that point of time, in such instances, we can give IV methylprednisolone and do a patch graft and then supplement it with the postoperatively with the help of the rheumatologist. Because there you don't have much of an option or, you know, you cannot immunosuppress before you do a definitive surgery. So it depends on the situation. Although we always prefer to first control the pathology and then uh, treat it. But in situations which are demanding, you may have to do them simultaneously. As regards the uh, T-seal glue or these uh, fibrin glue, sometimes you can use them along with the tenon's patch graft. So as Dr. Praful was showing us, so once you put the uh, tenon's patch graft, you can put a thin layer of the T-seal on that. Or if you're using an AMG, maybe two layers of AMG, you can put uh, the T-seal glue to secure it. Uh, just the T-seal glue may be in extremely tiny thinning areas or something like that, or sterile uh, melts or something like that one could try. 
but uh, and put a bandage lens but then again uh, you know if there is tissue loss it will not have that uh, tectonic uh, holding strength i think i i have a question for uh, praful praful in the presence of uh, infection what would be the uh, what would be your take on tenens graft if there is a active infection if there is a case of microbial keratitis which has perforated and the perforation is not large uh as would I you said, like to put I the tenens patch as i said i prefer tenens in a little bit quite eye that's why my report was in cases with corneal fistula when there was no infiltrate because passing suture is little bit difficult in in presence of necrotic tissue so if active infection is there perforness is small as i said tab cell should be the preferred choice because not only it gives you that support and also it has some bacteriostatic property which may may not be that useful but still uh, as far as compared to tenens is that tab cell should be the preferred one what about resolving microbial keratitis if you think the margin of the ulcer are not that necrotic or not that edematous to avoid you putting sutures because tenens um, there have been report people have used only fibrin glue to use uh, tenens patch graft but i don't think it will stick if the perforation is relatively large and there is active edema active infiltrate is there so if you if you can pass suture you can go ahead with tenens if you feel suturing won't be possible in those cases Maybe tenens plus glue BCL is a better option. So I think After that tenens patch put glue BCL glue yeah, over that. That needs to be clarified. I think. Okay. Okay, Praful, I have one uh, simple question. What's the fate of uh, tenens? What happens to the tenens if you do an it OCT gets, or something? Yeah. It yeah. gets epithelialized, but that, but I said it's opaque. That part, that area will be white only. Okay, so when you have tenon which is not tucked in uh, how easy or how difficult it is to get epithelized that so is that the reason where you said that you should tuck in the tenon yes, yes, and yes, putting yes. on the surface uh, does not help you to epithelize it as fast as when you tuck in the tenon uh, when it happens uh, if, if you are not uh, doing the tuck in part then epithelization uh, not only delayed in few cases we had to redo the surgery because epithelization never happened in those cases so that's why it's good to create a pocket and ensure that the tenens is below the epithelium and if you feel that your apposition is not well it's better to put in bcl thank you uh, one last thank question you. to dr nikhil uh, dr nikhil what yeah. uh, what is the longevity of uh, cyanoacrylate glue how long it stays and what do you do if it stays longer than what you need do you remove it because sometime if it is a perforation which is sort of holding on does it actually open up or do you open it in opd do you open it in ot what, what do you do how do you deal with such cases so we need to understand that it heals with vascularization so depending on the location of the perforation the time required for healing with a glue bcl will be different for example if you have glued a central perforation in an avascular cornea for example let's say sterile melt or something like that it will take a pretty long time for the vessels to reach there and uh, for the healing to happen so the amount of time the glue should stay will uh, basically be indicated by vessels around and even in front of the glued area so all around the glue once you see uh, vascularization it indicates that there is a healing process is going on and then probably you can consider removing the glue and the glue itself starts getting loose just like a scab falls off uh, following any wound injury so uh, typically it may be 3 months as long as 3 months for uh, more central lesions in the peripheral cornea or in vascularized corneas they would heal much faster and you can remove them faster actually if you are confident you can easily remove them even in the opd if the glue is loose or it's already sometimes you know just moving around uh, the only thing is that if uh, while removing the glue one has to be careful that you don't exert traction on the thin area otherwise it can sometimes create a new perforation and you might have to reglue it and of course if you don't have vascularization then sometimes the glue once you remove the glue there is again a hole there so that can be a rare instance which can happen you know the other thing i wanted to also mention is that when i i definitely see a good number of sterile melts which may be autoimmune in origin and originally as a fellow i probably was very happy gluing them 
but i have realized that they cause so much of scarring and vessel formation that now i tend to do more of patch grafts or small grafts which may be 4 mm or 4.5 mm in size sometimes they might be abutting just close to the optical axis also or at the edge of the pupil but in the long term they are avascular they hold well tectonically and the patient has much better uh, outcomes and even if you need to do a penetrating or a graft later it has much better success rate because the vessels are not there whereas once you do glue it's like a deep vascularization with scarring and uh, you know it makes things as a high risk thank you so nice sir but can Please. i add just one thing sure yeah. prof that's if, the if last comment there, from your yeah. side if glue is uh, there for a long time and it's very common at our setup what i do is i try to move it little bit on slate lab if it moves freely most likely the underlying area is well epithelialized but if it is not moving freely then it's better to take the patient to or and keep another set of glue fresh glue ready with you so the moment you take it out it may start leaking so this is that's that's I a mean. wonderful point uh, i think we'll 